Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Mark Morningstar coming at you with a January 2022 first of the year edition of Scoliosis World. Thank you for all join. Thank you all for joining me today, and I hope everybody had a great Christmas, Happy New Year, all that. So, 2022 can only look better for everybody, right? So, I wanted to start this podcast this week, this month, on something that would be appropriate for this time of year. And of course, being in January, being in Michigan, one of the big things we're all deficient in, or at least the vast majority of us are deficient in, is vitamin D. And so I'm going to kind of go back through and kind of link a lot of the research, especially just research in the last three, four years, that's been published equating vitamin D deficiency to scoliosis, specifically adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So I'm going to kind of get into some of the studies here that have been published in PubMed. Uh, so you're welcome to look these studies up here at, at your leisure uh, to verify all this information. But I'm going to kind of go through and, and kind of explain uh, what some of these studies are noticing, how vitamin D might be associated with idiopathic scoliosis. And of course, I'm going to kind of talk about some other, uh, one other complementary nutrient in particular that I think is increasingly important for a variety of reasons, and that's vitamin K2. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go into that. So let, let's dive right in. So first off, one of the things I've been advocating for for a long time is that scoliosis is not just a condition that affects the spine. Everybody looks at the spine or looks at scoliosis from a very orthopedic sense, meaning I look at an x-ray, I see a curvature on an x-ray, boom, I diagnose you with scoliosis. The problem is that there are a variety of other non-spine symptoms, signs, uh, abnormal metabolic processes, there are other things happening that don't involve the spine directly and were typically happening before any sign of a curvature ever developed. And one of the things, as an example, even in young adolescent children, they have identified that those children typically, typically have a lower than average bone density, even related to their non-scoliosis peers. So bone density right away has been something that has been, le that has been uh, attributed or associated with scoliosis across the lifespan. I mean, most of us just think of low bone density as something that happens to us when you know, we hit middle age or you know, 50 and up, go through menopause, that kind of thing. And that's when low bone density typically has a chance of becoming a problem. But what they have found over time, and it's been studied time and again, is that even young children who develop a curve typically have a lower than average bone density than their peers. What's the connection to that? Well, a couple of big connections to that is vitamin D and some other nutrients that are required for bone building processes, right? Uh, vitamin K2 is another one for specific reasons. So, but bone density is just one of those other non, non curvature aspects of scoliosis, right? You know, for those of you who've ever seen any other previous episodes of our podcast, uh, you'll know that we, we stress hormone metabolism, you know, significantly. Uh, we look at neurotransmitter disruptions. We, you look at a lot of gastrointestinal or digestive disturbances, things like that, because those are all part and parcel to the curve developing. And of course, when all of those things pre-exist, and now you lump a rapid growth spur on top of it, well, that sort of leads the groundwork uh, for a rapid curvature developing if that child were to have a rapid growth spurt or at least their main puberty growth spurt. So, uh, but I'm going to kind of, st I'm going to kind of stick within the confines for, for this podcast on vitamin D, vitamin K and, and kind of the benefits of those uh, sample doses, that sort of thing. Because, you know, a lot of people here hear about vitamin D. A lot of people already take vitamin D. But a lot of people don't really know what doses of vitamin D are really beneficial. And there is some debate about benefit about the dose of those as well, especially depending on the provider you talk to, whether that person is more of a, a, a traditional medical person or somebody who's more in, into the CAM therapies, that kind of thing, you know, complementary alternative therapies. You know, it depends on who you talk to. And they're, they're, you know, the data is sort of debatable for both sides. So... 
but I'm just going to give you a lot of this data that's out here. So for example, this study, this was published, just so you guys have all the references here. This was done uh, in Journal of Medicine and Life in 2000, April of 2020. So again, these are all recent studies. It's not like this was something that was done 20 years ago or anything like that. And again, what they found is that the average vitamin D in patients with idiopathic scoliosis was about 24 nanograms. Now, to give you an idea, 24 nanograms is clinically deficient, right? The If I were to go up to a normal routine lab, let's say Quest Laboratories, which is a pretty big nationwide laboratory, the Quest typically says that anything above 30 is considered normal. And they, you know their range is essentially is 30 to 100. Well, the problem becomes, what you have to understand when you interpret lab results, is that that 30 to 100 normal range, quote unquote, is really just a bell curve average of everybody who's had that particular test done by that laboratory. Now, let me ask you a logical question. How many people do you know, or maybe you yourself, how many people do you know go and have their blood drawn because they feel like a million bucks and they have no symptoms whatsoever, right? Obviously nobody everybody's going to have their blood drawn because they're having some type of a clinical symptom or something that warranted having blood work drawn short of the typical, you know, I have to go for my annual visit, you know, annual physical, and they're just doing a basic CBC chemistry panel. But when we talk about vitamin D, of course, now you're getting a bell curve average of people who are, you know, clinically uh, symptomatic. So already, even scoliosis, idiopathic scoliosis patients have a vitamin D level that is even deficient by their standards, right? So that just tells you how really adequate, you know, inadequate or, or dramatically low 24 actually is. I mean, if you're considering probably a healthy vitamin D level is really at least 50, in my opinion, 70 and higher. So 24 is very, very low, right? Now, this was, like I said, this study was done in 2020. And all of the people that they looked at in this study was 101 patients and their average Cobb angle was 26 degrees. So that's one study in 2020. I go then on to a second study here. This was done, uh, let me pull up the right tab here. Uh, here we go. This is Biomed Central or BMC Pediatrics, May of 2020, again, all recent data. Uh, in this one, very interesting study, same thing. There, they in 67 of their patients, their average vitamin D level was 37. Interesting difference, 24 or 37. Um, however, interestingly, again, when you talk about a normal, normal's 30 and up, what they found is even though the, the average was 37, 92% of those patients were had levels below normal. Now, I'm guessing to have an average of 37, probably a lot of them were, you know, 28, 29, 27, something like that, because the standard deviation is 26. So you can see this going all the way down to 10 in some cases, according to their data. So um, obviously, again, vitamin D deficiency implicated in idiopathic scoliosis. Um, now, those were patients who were had a surgical level curve. So what they did is they did their vitamin D as part of the preoperative blood testing. And that's what they found. So these are all patients who are going to have scoliosis surgery. Um, let's see. Next one here. This one published in ACTA Orthopedics and Traumatology uh, 2019. This is a meta-analysis done. Systematic review. The single most powerful study design there is when we talk about hierarchy of evidence. A meta-analysis or a systematic review is more powerful than even a randomized clinical trial because these kinds of studies assess all of the randomized clinical trials on a particular topic, in this case, vitamin D. And even in here, they conclude in this systematic review that vitamin D deficiency is involved in the pathogenesis or the causation of idiopathic scoliosis because of its impact on the calcium phosphorus balance in bone or bone metabolism. And their, their recommendation is simply to check all patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis to check their vitamin D levels. 
Again, that's a very strong recommendation. Um, next one. So let me switch gears a little bit here. So we talk about having low vitamin D and idiopathic scoliosis. There is a genetic component to that also, right? In fact, there are a study done here, pulling this up right now. Again, this is in the journal Medicine, a review study published in 2018. It's again, three years old. Um, where they reviewed some of the genetic variants in the vitamin D receptors of the body in relation to scoliosis. And what they found is that there were a couple of different genomic variants that were that popped up much more frequently in children who had adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, and what that does is it makes it easier to ha for that person's vitamin D receptors to be somewhat misshapen, okay? Now, what's the impact of that? So, for example, let's say I were to, to have a key made for a lock in a door, and I have that original key made, then I make a copy of that key, right? And you know how sometimes when you make a copy of a key, the key, the copy was a little bit misshapen or wasn't exactly cut right. And so now when you put it into the key lock, you have to kind of jiggle a little bit or, or turn it a little bit harder or give that a little bit of extra effort to get it to fit and then unlock the door. Receptors are the same way. Receptors on your cells work by having a molecule park or bind to that receptor, kind of like a car fitting in a parking lot spot. Well, if that receptor is a little bit misshapen, it makes that molecule just that little bit tougher to fit into that spot. So it doesn't open the cell to allow the vitamin D then to get inside the cell. So when those vitamin D receptors are misshapen, it makes it easier for that person to become vitamin D deficient. Because even if their levels of circulating vitamin D are normal, if your body is not using vitamin D, then it doesn't matter what your circulating level is, right? Kind of, if you guys watch my podcast, you know, we talk about hormones. Blood hormone testing only shows you the inactive hormone. It doesn't show you how much of that hormone your body's using. Vitamin D is no different. Vitamin D is still a hormone. And if you only look at it from a, a vitamin D level, well, let's say somebody has a level of 40. Well, that might be normal based on laboratory standards. But if that person's not using vitamin D, then their level is irrelevant. And so if that person has genetic variants that make it easier for them to have vitamin D uh, deficiency through that vitamin D receptor malformation, let's call it, that um, you want to make sure that that person has a higher or at the very high end of normal vitamin D level to make it easier or to flood the supply side, so to speak, so that there's enough vitamin D floating around that it makes it as easy as possible for the body to latch onto it when available. So that's really the, the best workaround present day for somebody who has that vitamin D receptor uh, genetic predisposition, right? Um, so these are very key. And of course, the problem becomes, especially adults today, you know, 35, 40, 50 and up, when they were children, you know, nobody did anything about this information. In fact, most people aren't doing anything about this information now. But the, the idea is that if I'm a child who has a vitamin D deficiency, I grow up now to become an adult with that same predisposition or with that same chronic vitamin D deficiency, and now it just affects me in other ways. You know, we're only talking about the orthopedic slash scoliosis ramifications of vitamin D deficiency, but it doesn't take much of a Google search or even to go on to PubMed and look at the plethora of metabolic reactions that require vitamin D uh, from immune system health, all kinds of things. In fact, vitamin D is one of the biggest things right now they talk about with COVID is to make sure your vitamin D levels are normal, to have the best chance of fighting it off as, without it impacting you or impacting you as least as possible. So, um, you know, vitamin D is important for a multitude of reasons. Um, one of the interesting things, again, to kind of go back to scoliosis and also is, you know, one study 37, the other study 24, 26, whatever it was. Um, and what's the difference? Well, interestingly, somebody put together a, a paper here, a uh, paper out of Greece back in 2006. This is the oldest one that I have in here. But Dr. Grievous, who I know from SOSORT, published this study. 
And what they were able to show is that there tended to be a geographical difference in the occurrence of scoliosis depending on where you live. And what they found is that the 25th parallel or 25 north latitude, um, anybody living above that, uh, that geographic line was more likely to have scoliosis because the sunlight differences and the vitamin D differences were more likely to impact melatonin production. And of course, melatonin has long been studied going all the way back to the mid 1980s as being a causative agent or at least a strong associative agent for idiopathic scoliosis. And what they found is that the melatonin processing differences, depending on where you live, caused teenage girls to go into, pu to take longer to hit puberty. And of course, the longer it takes for you to hit puberty, the easier it is. And, and what tends to happen is that girls whose periods are delayed are more likely to have an aggressive scoliosis or one, meaning one that will eventually require surgical intervention. And I thought that was interesting that there's a, a big geographic difference, right? And the 25th parallel, so the 25th parallel, if you, you have to want to look up where that's at, 25th parallel basically goes through northern Africa, goes right through the heart of India, uh, goes right through uh, the southern portion of Mexico. So basically the entire United States, of course, is above this line. I think it goes through Cuba, too, when I map quested it. But um, basically most all of North America is above the 25th parallel. Uh, so that, that's quite interesting. And of course, it speaks to the vitamin D because there are other, other studies on other things, autoimmune things like MS have also been you know, sort of correlated to low vitamin D status in the northern climates. More people are susceptible to those kinds of vitamin D deficient illnesses, let's say. Um, now, one of the other things, so let's say somebody doesn't have the genetic predisposition, right? Or we want to put somebody on vitamin D. Well, the purpose of going on vitamin D also is to help drive a lot of the minerals into your bone to help with your bone density. Increase your bone density as a child or certainly maintain your bone density when you're an adult. Um, one of the big co-factors or let's say co-vitamin factors that I typically advocate with vitamin D is something called vitamin K or in the, the supplement form, we prescribe it as vitamin K2. And the, the reason why it's K2 and not K1 is that K1, for example, is a vitamin that's typically found in your dark green leafy vegetables. So think, classically, you think of K1 being in spinach, right? The problem is if I were to eat a spinach salad right now, the, the amount of vitamin K1 that's in that salad that gets into my system, the, the amount of time it takes for my body to burn through that vitamin K1 is essentially about six to eight hours and it's out of my system and my body's completely burned through it. So it's a, a vitamin that gets very rapidly utilized and burned up. However, vitamin K2 takes almost three days to burn through once I ingest it. So if I take a, a, a nutrient supplement form of vitamin K2, it takes my body three days to burn through all that. So much, much easier to get your vitamin K2 blood levels up to a therapeutic level, meaning it's going to have the clinical response that we want. Well, vitamin K2 does a lot of things also. So first off, vitamin K2 is the main enzyme that works in tandem with a protein called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin is what helps drive a lot of your minerals into your bone. So if your osteocalcin isn't working right, you're not going to have normal bone density. In fact, a lot of integrative medicine doctors, for example, will measure people's osteocalcin blood levels as a marker of bone density or monitoring the therapeutic effects of whatever treatment that provider is recommending or having that patient do. Um, one of the other things that vitamin K2 does is it actually allows your body to use insulin better or uh, help with help preventing insulin resistance. So there are a lot of things in that way, which in, in fact, a lot of integrative medicine practitioners will use vitamin K2 for polycystic ovaries. Because again, the chief dysfunction in polycystic ovaries is a lack of proper insulin uh, sensitivity. Uh, or most people with, most women with PCOS have insulin resistance. And of course, increasing insulin sensitivity is the chief goal in that. And vitamin K2 is one of those nutrient therapies that can help assist that. Um, in fact, if I go here, there was a PubMed study. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. In the journal 
hormone metabolism and research. Um, this is 2016, so I apologize. This one's a little bit older, but randomized placebo controlled trial showing that taking a combination of a vitamin K2 and D3 supplement actually helped a lot of the inflammation and, and blood markers of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Very, very interesting. And this is, like I said, this is hormone metabolism research, randomized clinical trial done in 2016. Uh, so K2 is very important. So a lot of times, a lot of people will take D3. And in fact, D3 is very often found in uh, multivitamins, but it's typically pretty low. So for example, most multivitamins, depending on if it's a kid's multi or an adult's multi, of course, uh, most, uh, most adult multivitamins, the level is somewhere around 400 or so international IU, international units of vitamin D3. What we would typically recommend for adult at a minimum is 5,000 units a day. Now, as an example, we can take all the way up because, uh, of course, I'm, as you all know who pay attention to this podcast, I'm the chief science officer for Scully Smart. In the Scully Smart, we have a product called Bone Matrix Support. That pill alone has 50,000 units. And in doing, in taking that pill, most adults only take one or two pills a week of that product and it gets their vitamin D3 levels up very, very quickly. We also have a combination K2 D3 product that we use, which has 5,000 units of the D3, plus it also has uh, the vitamin K2 combined with it to give it the added boost to help with bone density. So um, one of the things we're, we're starting to shift gears on, is, and again, the, the thing that I struggle with personally as a clinical provider is that I hate to have to do blood draws on a lot of young children, right? So to me, the nice thing with the K2 D3 supplement is that the 5,000 enough to be effective fairly quickly, especially in say a, a nine to 13 year old or, or older, but it's not too much that we're gonna get their blood levels up too high too quickly. So it's kind of, it's a dose that's in that sweet spot for both kids and adults. And But in some adults, it might frankly be a little bit on the low end. Although it's easy to take two of them a day, or maybe we also go up to the uh, 50,000 unit, uh, 50, unit capsule once or twice a week. So we have multiple options available for our kids and adults who need this therapy. And of course, you know the, the reality is, uh, depending on other data that you read, anybody essentially north of, you know, I think it's something like Cincinnati, Ohio, latitude-wise, uh, everybody north of that, that geographic line is basically vitamin D deficient for, you know, three or four months of the year. So for example, vitamin D dose adjustments can be made depending on the time of year. Cause of course, obviously if I were to go out in the middle of July outside and play in a tank top or a short sleeve shirt, 20 minutes of sun exposure in the middle of the summer is going to cause my body to make 10 to 20,000 units of vitamin D, depending on how dark or light skinned I am. You know, the darker skinned a person is, the more melanin they have in their skin, it takes longer for sun exposure to produce the same amount of vitamin D. Uh, so somebody like me might take no time at all. But um, the in the winter time, of course, sun exposure is a lot less. And we, you know, we don't have as many daylight hours. The, you know, the sun's farther away from, you know, farther away from us. So we don't necessarily get as much concentration of the ultraviolet light exposure to cause our skin to produce vitamin D3. And so we need to take it supplementally uh, if we want to maintain normal levels. And in fact, going all the way back as early as 2007, they had discovered that in women who were uh, in kind of discussing the risk factors associated with the various female reproductive cancers, breast, ovarian, uterine, etc., one of the main um, one of the main risk reducing factors they found was in women who had a blood vitamin D3 level of 70 or higher. So in my mind, as a clinician, if I'm looking at female reproductive cancers as sort of you know the worst case scenario of the things that I look at on a day-to-day -day basis, if having a vitamin D level of 70 or higher is one of the better protections against those things, well, I would want every patient to be have a vitamin D level of 70 or higher. Why wouldn't I? And then the nice thing is, is vitamin D as a supplement is very easy to obtain, very, very minimal cost-wise. 
And depending on how much you can, how much you take on a day or weekly basis, you can get your vitamin D levels back up to normal or optimal very quickly. And the nice thing about vitamin D is that, and vitamin K is that they're fat-soluble vitamins. So for example, when you talk about fat-soluble, they're vitamins that get stored in your fat cells. If you, so for example, if I take a bunch at once and I don't need all of it at one time, the excess that I'm taking gets stored in my fat cells until such point in time that my blood levels of that nutrient drop and then my fat storage kicks it back out in the bloodstream. Unlike, say, for example, vitamin C or vitamin or the various B vitamins, those are water soluble, meaning as soon as you take them, you're burning through them and you're peeing out whatever you don't need at that moment, which is why if you take a B complex supplement, for example, your pee looks you know, highlight or yellow you know, for the rest of the day because you're peeing out the excess right away. So those vi water soluble vitamins have to be replenished on a day to day basis. Fat soluble vitamins, however, people sometimes can get away with taking them once a week if you take the right dose. So hence, that 50,000 unit capsule is nice because for most adult patients, depending on the time of year, they only take one or two capsules per week and they don't have to worry about it. So it's not something that, you know, again, when you talk about adults like me who are taking, you know, 30, 40 supplements a day, feels like anyway, you know, it gets to where the, the more I can reduce my pills, the better. So sort of food for thought today on vitamin D. Uh, Vitamin D and vitamin K2, their main impact on bone density. And we know that bone density is a problem across the entire lifespan of a child who ends up developing a curve. So if we know that that bone density is potentially a risk factor, probably not a bad idea to start most all idiopathic scoliosis children on a vitamin D, if not also a vitamin K2 supplement right away. So any concerns, reach out to me personally, Dr. Morningstar at scoliosmart.com. You can also visit our website, treatingscoliosis.com, to read more about those supplements. But that's Scoliosis World here for January. Everybody stay warm. Uh, hopefully here next month, uh, come the next podcast, uh, maybe things will be start looking up weather-wise. But uh, here's looking forward to a great 2022, everybody. Thanks.